this, the panel is developing an Occupy Wall Street vision for the future. Uh, the panel is organized around uh, to, to address three uh, questions, uh, three concerns, and, and that is, what has been the actual process for developing a longer-term vision for the Occupy Wall Street movement? And second, what might need to happen for this process to move forward in a way that strengthens the movement? And three, what general elements might or ought to be part of this longer-term vision? And so we have some people here who have uh, participated, and which obviously many people here, uh, all of you, most of you, many of you may have participated. And so we're hoping to uh, have, have these folks present you with some of their thinking on these questions before opening it up and having a, a, a general discussion. Uh, to my left here, Sandy Nurse, who is an um, Occupy Wall Street organizer, primarily working with the Direct Action Working Group. She came to Occupy Wall Street on Septa Saturday, September 17th and camped out for three weeks. Sandy comes from, um, you mind me saying it like that, the big institutions background? Um, <laughs> having previously worked for the United Nations, NATO, the U.S. federal government, community-based organizations in East Africa, um, State Senator Edward M. Augustus, and the American Anti-Slavery Group. group. Um, Yotam, uh, Yotam Maroum is a political organizer. He's sitting here in the, the center. Uh, he's an educator and writer based in New York. He has been active in, Occupy Wall, in the Occupy Wall Street movement and is a member of the Organization for a Free Society. Yotam has experienced student activism, anti-austerity struggles, um, democratic education, and um, has a background in communal living as well. And... <laughs> <laughs> um, and on the far... Left end is <laughs> Nalini Stamp, um, who is an organizer and has worked with the Working Families Party for uh, four years. She's been working to bridge the gap between OWS and labor as well. Uh, she also organizes uh, direct action uh, activities and is also a member of organization for a, a free society. Um, I think I've, I figured the place to start probably would be about vision in a big sense and then kind of work backwards and think about maybe what we've done and what we've seen in, in the Occupy movement so far related to vision and, then, and, and where we might go. Um, but I first want to kind of make a case for why we need vision in the first place and why we're talking about this. Um, I, I think, and, and I think probably a lot of us agree about this. Uh, basically, we need vision for a, a few reasons. One is uh, for, for the sense of it. Sorry, let me. Um, we need vision for a bunch of different so um, We need vision for a variety of different reasons. One of the reasons we need vision is because that's uh, something that helps people plug in and see their sort of their desires, their wishes, their dreams in the movement. Um, another reason we need vision is because in reality, and anybody who's organized for a while can, can say this I think with some authority, and so maybe other people in the room can chime in about that, but in reality people don't lay their shit on the line unless they have an idea of what they're going to get instead. And that's, uh, I think, something we, we run up against a lot in our movements is, the, uh, is kind of like, you know, uh, creating campaigns or creating actions and wondering where everyone's at. Um, and I think, you know, part of, that, part of the reason for that is this fear of enunciating a vision, which I think comes out of uh, a desire to not want to um, impose vision on other people, which I think is an important, I think that's an important part of the discussion, and we don't want to create something that then shuts out discussion. We don't want to be so clear about what we want so as to be inflexible, because in reality we don't really even have all of the tools we need to think about the world that we want, because we're so uh, deeply entrenched in this world, um, and so we're, as we struggle, kind of developing a language to create vision. Uh, but I think that being said, we still have a responsibility to dream and to and to plan and to think ahead, uh, because that's what that's what convinces people that we're serious. I think, uh, in a large sense, I think cynicism is a real enemy, and it's something that we have to contend with in a serious way. Um, I, you know, I've been doing different kinds of activism for a while, and other people here in this room for much longer, and I think probably all of us would admit that we get 
cynical too. And I mean, this is kind of a, in a in, in a sense the people a, a room full of people who do this and think about this and care about this and really are part of what we hope is becoming a movement for a really meaningful social transformation. And I often don't believe that it's possible. And that's a that's real. I mean, that's something that I, I was running up against just before all of this stuff happened, like sitting around at home, like moping about how fucked up the left is. And and then, you know, one of the things that Occupy Wall Street did was kind of shatter that, shatter that, like, you know, punch a hole through that idea that there is no alternative and we don't fight back. So there is an alternative and we do fight back. But that's part of the, you know, the, that's part of the need for being able to, to, to talk about the kind of world that we want is to really actually convince ourselves and all the people around us that it is possible that we don't we are not resigned to capitalism authoritarianism white supremacy and patriarchy there's no uh, reason that you know not only is it possible to have an alternative it we must demand an alternative because this actually is not sustainable this can't actually carry on um, and so that great myth that there is no alternative, which is one of the really sophisticated tools that these systems of oppression use to keep us in the place that we're at, that's uh, a myth that we have to shatter in order to empower ourselves to fight. Um, so that's another, uh, another sort of layer of the, of the reasoning for vision. And I think that uh, the third reason is because our vision is what helps us uh, decide how to struggle. So knowing the world that we want informs the way that we fight. And I think so that may not to take it back to the sort of uh, the occupation and, and, and Occupy Wall Street broader than that, I think you see a vision being kind of um, carried out in its really early like seedling forms with an occupation. That that, is, that that was a space where people were experimenting with a world that they might want. Um, and I think so, and I think all of this kind of ties into the, the question of um, of, of a broader strategy anyway, and, and uh, you know, what we see as the center of that, and I would argue that the center of, what a, of a revolutionary strategy ought to be dual power. Uh, and that is you know, the creation of the alternatives that we need to carry out the values of a free society while also you know, waging a battle to knock down the institutions of the status quo that keep us on the margins. And we need to do both of those things at the same time. Um, and you know, if you if you look around the left, and, and it, this is starting to look different now, but traditionally speaking, you you have a lot of alternative institutions, like different kinds of alternative institutions, from food co-ops to eco farms to communal living arrangements to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those are incredibly important uh, for a variety of reasons because they are imaginative and they like start to like grope at at what another world will look like, but it all, they also meet people's needs. But they're incredibly handicapped in the sense that they only meet the needs of a very few largely privileged, privileged population that's able to access that. And it, that's not an answer for society. It's certain, and, and if it ever was an answer for the rest of society, then it would be smashed because we're not living in like la-la land where we get to just like build up our alternative institutions and like win like small reforms and eventually we'll be in a free society. It's not how it works. When systems of oppression feel threatened, they lash out. And they smash you, and so you know. So, so th those alternatives have have serious limitations if they're on their own. And the same is true for counter institutions. There are always all sorts of counter institutions, from labor unions and anti-war movements and direct action networks, and all those things are are uh, sorry counter the counter institutions. Those are institutions that kind of run up against the status quo and fight to create space. Um, and those things are also are are limited in their ability to to dream. So a lot of those. Uh, counter institutions that we see around us actually don't really carry in them the values of a free society, and that's their shortcoming. And so they need each other. And eventually, what you know, this process of developing a counterpower is uh, then uh, those institutions becoming one thing, becoming one thing. So designing institutions that, on the one hand, meet our needs in the here and now in a way that actually carries out the values of a free society, while also having the sort of sharp edges. That, that kind of like muscle space for those things to grow. Um, and I think that's what a, a dual power struggle is. And so when you look at the occupation in its, in its early days, that's a little bit of what you see, like the very early, early uh, birth of what might potentially become a dual power movement. You have an occupation uh, is, a, is a space where, you know, on the one hand, people are experimenting with all kinds of alternatives. So, you know, we're practicing various kinds of direct, direct democracy, uh, you know, there's a medical tent, there's a free library, there are like, we get to experiment with all these um, kind of mini institutions to meet the needs of this kind of like new 
population, and at the same time, it's a staging ground for a struggle outwards. So that place is a launch pad for a fighting against the banks, which obviously is a stand-in for like finance capital and the state and so on, and, and that and that struggle develops. Of course, we're like at at you know the very early stages of a, of a, of that kind of movement. I mean, so those alternatives were largely symbolic, and they met the needs of a of a relatively small group, and the struggle outwards was also largely symbolic and ha and and like. Um, served to to potentially change the narrative of the of the like politic of the politics around us, but they didn't actually, uh, you know, they're they're only at the very beginning of a really challenging like the you know the powers we're fighting against. Um, so I think that where we're at now is um, trying to turn our resistance from symbolic to real, and I think that we're we're seeing that in a lot of different ways. Um, but I think a prerequisite for that is really dreaming big and really thinking out what kind of world do we want to get. And you know, again, because that's what gets people to uh, to know that you're serious. It's what allows you to be able to experiment as you go. It's what informs the way you struggle. It's what um, helps people like really um, really participate because they believe that that we might actually win. And that's that's a reality. We have to win. I mean, because it's not we're facing like incredibly serious systems of oppression that actually you know, hurt people on a day-to-day -day level, but also really stamp out human potential in a serious way. And uh, so we owe it to ourselves to win. And if we win, we had better fucking know what we're going to do with it, you know? Uh, and, and that's what that's what I think is a responsibility uh, of, of, of the movement that we're trying to grow. Um, so I, I could ramble more. I feel like I rambled quite a bit. I have five Mormons? Well, that's, I don't know, guys. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I think I'll, I will stop there for now. I mean, maybe if we come back, then we can, like, I think it's, it's useful to actually try to work out some of that stuff. And I think um, how, I would, how I would suggest <laughs> to think through um, this creation of kind of like, vi like vision, visioning and so on is um, thinking first about values um, and then try to carry them through into institutions. And looking at the institutions that we have and seeing what values they have embedded in them. Like if you look at, you know, a school is a really great example. You look at a school in this society, it carries inside of it all of the values of, uh, of this society. So it's like a deeply authoritarian structure where like students like sit in rows, they face the front, the teacher speaks, the teacher decides who speaks and when, they call on, and the teacher can stand and walk and leave the room and whatever, but the students sit in place. Um, and that teacher, that's like a clearly authoritarian structure. It's also like a competitive structure as opposed to a solidaristic one. The students are all there, but they don't talk to each other. They never talk to each other. They talk to the front. They're like oh. the... Sorry? Did you go to? <laughs> <laughs> I actually went to a really cute school, but uh, <laughs> but no, but uh, they talk to each other, but in spite of the school, the school doesn't facilitate the. And then they talk to each other as part of the program. That yeah, that's I I don't think that that's the experience of most public school students in New York City, but I, I mean, that's something that we could debate. But I think I think the point is that although a lot of uh, although the school is a community, and in a sense, it's one of the most important community building institutions. That, a human has, I and mean, we spend like eight hours a day in this institution until we're like twenty or something like this. Like an ignore, it's like what the church used to be. It's like an incredibly important community building device that actually does very little to foster solidarity among students. And students develop that, but generally outside the context of the school, and actually in spite of it, usually the, the students are talking shit about the school, and because they are forced to develop their identities outside of that. Um, and so I think we can, you know, look at other kinds of. Um, values that we find in that institution. And then, and then let's think about what a liberated school would look like. You know, like intentional time for community building, for group building in the school. Uh, students that work on, um, you know, that where like social justice work is part of their curriculum. Where, you know, and, th and that starts to like express different values that you see, like autonomy within solidarity or like equity. And, you know, and so I think part of what we ought to do is think about the values that we want in a free society, and, and imagine not only what the institutions that we have now would look like, but also think of new institutions that would allow us to carry out those values. The, like the economy that we have now is, is full of institutions that facilitate a certain kind of character type. They, they carry out certain values. They, are like, um, they, they promote certain values, and the, the economy that we want should be like equitable and solidaristic, and it should allow for people to have autonomy, but also in solidarity with the greater thing. We need to develop institutions that allow that. Um, and so, yeah, I, mean, that's, I think I'll leave it there for now. As far as vision, you know, and, and, and thanks everybody who's, who's here today, and thank you, Chris, uh, for bringing this together. Um, I think that there, there are kind of like three different things that we, we've went through. We had vision for the actual occupation space, you know, like what we wanted to see 
um, when we were actually occupying. Um, we had a you know post occupation as they call post traumatic stress disorder of, of of the occupation. You know, a vision. We actually did a visioning exercise in pace, um, where we kind of wrote out what we thought would you know our vision was for um, the months coming afterwards. And then I think we're at a place where we're starting to shift, um, so we can think about visioning about the future. Um, I think that a, like a lot of it, and going back to to, to the occupation, it was about. You know, do we want more space at that moment in time? Do we, you know, is this is this sustainable? Like we're, we recreated, um, our we re we ended up recreating society in in the park. You know, it, at first it was very liberating, and and it was the whole the whole thing was liberating. But then it, it did turn into what are the problems that we face in society? Patriarchy, racism. Like we we went we ran into those problems. And that's what you do when you have a bunch of people who are like, you know, smashed together in, in you know in a park. Um, to the point where we did have, you know, there was division, you know, the south side of the park, you know. I mean, it was, it was, pretty, it was pretty crazy. Um, and, 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 and that happened. And it's because, you know, we haven't really, that, that, that's something that's a, a new form. And we were bringing in new people and new people were experiencing. And, and, and for myself, I changed a lot of my views of the political world and my vision of what, I, of what society looks like. So I think that, that was, that's really important that we, ha that we had that, that visioning in, in the occupation, what occupation looks like and for future discussions. And then I think the post-occupation was really, really, really interesting, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, for a while, and we're, obviously we're still post-occupation, but I think we're, we are in a different period. Um, for, for winter sucks, right? Winter is depressing. Every, you know, that's why spring break exists. So people have like a break, you know. We, when winter does suck, so it doesn't matter if you're occupying no matter what, winter just, it's cold. In the Northeast at least, and if you're from the South, you know, Good job. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> or from the West Coast. And, and yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that the po we were trying to figure out what was there. What was it another occupation space? Like, what was our vision for what we had? I mean, a lot of, I mean, I can speak for myself, but the experience that I've, I've seen and heard were, were a lot of, what, what do I do? What do we do? What I said, what do I do? I, I mean, I, I buried myself in my house for a week, you know, because I didn't know what to do. And... I think at that moment in time, things started to go to like the local visioning. Like, what do we envision in our neighborhoods? What do we envision? And the local assemblies started started popping up all over the places, and people started talking and making those connections. And for me, I, I, I feel that we need a cultural shift to actually, you know, really get to a visioning of a co you know a collective visioning for our future, because we we are you know our our culture, and for the most part in in in, in the states is capitalism. You know, like, I mean, I, I can't stop looking at my phone sometimes, you know. We are attached to these material things that, um, that have changed us and have changed the way we operate. And some of that material is the reason why I occupy really spruced up, you know. Caught, you know, everybody texting friends every night saying, come down to the occupation. Everybody going on Facebook and Twitter and all these things that I never had had before. Um, I, well, I have Facebook, but. Um, so, so I think that, you know, I... We had started to think after in December and in January, what what can we do on our local level? How can we communicate with people? How can we talk about and thinking differently? Which was great because that's what in other revolutionary periods in South African apartheid, that's what it was. It was the cultural, it was the community, it was the at conversations, it was in the schools, it was in the, it was outside of the schools on the street and conversations that people were having that co that um, helped collectivize a vision for their liberation and freedom. Um, I think now we're in a period where we are starting to, you know, there was this whole diversity of tactics thing that kind of kind of spruced up and really got really contentious. Um, and I think that that and, that, and that's going to happen. You know, we, we, are, we are all going to have different tactics and not all of us might agree on strategy, but we have to agree for having a, a, you know, a, liberating, a, a liberating period, an actual point where we, we want to collectively help each other, whether it is, you know, um, whether it is an inside-outside strategy, you know, whether it is within, you know, the local governments, because that's what, I mean, this morning, um, you know, Lisa Vivian was saying this on, on the panel I was moderating, that the, the right and the conservatives have infiltrated every local space and has built that up, and from the school boards to the town boards and on your state legislators, and really, and we're always fighting them in, like, presidential elections. Like, we're always, you know, as far as the electoral process goes. And the smashing of unions and the smashing of, 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 of the union power has come because of this local, their vision of a local 
and and different tactics, right? You had the Tea Party was one tactic, and the moderate conservatives who still like their big banks and so on and so forth. And you had, you know, you also have um, so, you know, um, some of the folks who. In, there were so many different tactics, and that's how that rose to be a power that governs governs us right now. So I think that right now we are in a period where we are people are starting to talk to each other about the diversity of tactics and not getting into contentious arguments, and that's really important. I think that's a really important key to developing a vision for the future. Um, I think that we need to continue having, and in my opinion, having those conversations. Um, sitting down, whether it's um, you know education and empowerment, whether it's in, in, you know in the classrooms, wherever people go on their everyday lives, that vision has to start changing there to really build and build collectively together. Um, as far as you know, and the Occup and also the Occupy movement is completely diverse across the country. You know, not one. I mean, at least I've only been to a few, but not you know. I went to Detroit in November, and that was different than what we were dealing with at that time. Like completely different. Like there were no cops in Grand Circus Park, like, no whatsoever, none whatsoever, <laughs> and buildings, empty buildings around the whole thing, and that's, that's the state that Detroit is in right now, you know, I, you know, um, D.C. was completely different, too, you know, they are at the heart, of, that's the nation's capital, it's, the capital's right there, they can see it, pastry, um, I had two random occupations in the beginning, and, and so on and so forth, so I think that that, for, for, for having a discussion about developing a vision for the Occupy movement, or at least not even Occupy Wall Street. We need to start with our, our on, on the local level for some folks, you know, talking to each other and really conversing and then make that, have that build. But always know that it's a learning process too, because I think that that's, and that's something I know I personally did, but just like, oh, well, I know what I'm talking about because I'm an organizer, you know? And like, that's not always the case. You know, we all have things to learn. We all have things to learn from to each other. And that's what popular education is about, you know? Um, is about learning and is about talking and is about discussing and I think that the, to, to, to come to it a way where you know what my vision is you know ass assemblies that are federated and workers councils that are federated and you know it, and just places that are federated from you know the small you know a school to you know, a daycare center to that is that is developing its own community and actually building those alternatives and stacking it up while we're fighting the institutions as well so I think yeah as far as as, as far as developing that vision I, I would love to kind of just food for thought, or does that make sense? Yeah, that's very good. Sorry, I'm really bad with those analogies, but I throw them out there all the time. Um, I think that we we should start thinking about what is the vision that we want to see where we where we live, or where we work, or where we're at, or where we organize, and then start talking about that because it's uncomfortable to even talk. And I I was a canvasser for a long time, and I talked to the most conservative people all over the state and sometimes they've got radical ideas too you know and I think that that's a big big thing too is that how how do we start to converse with people who might think they are on the same thing but the systems that are above us have told us that we are too different have created that divide and conquer they've divided us they said okay you're on the left you're on the right and maybe it's ultra left ultra right and you need to not communicate or you can't communicate to each other so we decide not to it was extremely uncomfortable. I mean, things that talking, I'm talking to folks in, in not that Suffolk County, not to generalize Suffolk County, but in, in certain places that I was at. Um, I mean, I grew up in Staten Island, so it's like you know. Um, but in places that you know, talking to folks, you would just be surprised. It's just the jargon that is thrown out there. And if we can start creating those those alternatives and actually building up, we can probably have a collective vision with the real 99 percent, which is like I've actually multiple different people. I'm 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 good. <laughs> um, yeah, so I won't even talk that long because I'm just looking at this room and everyone here seems to be an occupier um, in some shape or form, so I feel like we can just even have a conversation about it. Um, I agree with Nalini that uh, at, the beginning, at the beginning phases of the occupation, it was, we were able to have um, collective visioning, and it, that was found in the Declaration of the Occupation, it's found in the, the Principles of Solidarity. There were things that we could actually work on and say we we have problems with X, Y, and Z, or we are for X, Y, and Z, and we've seen to as we've gotten away from the park, um, forgot about those very fundamental things that we can still use, and I think we should use. I think um, a lot of these conversations are happening in smaller groups, um, and I think attempts where they've been in the larger groups, like the visioning session, I feel like it 
there were different experiences with that. People felt alienated because they felt like coming to some kind of unified vision doesn't make sense um, in a world where we're all coming from very diverse experiences and backgrounds and we all have very different political perspectives. It, it doesn't make sense, at least in my personal opinion, to come to a unified vision. And I think the, the real goal or the challenge should be to um, work to be okay with multiple visions and, and multiple directions and, and us all being comfortable working and moving in many different directions but know that we're moving together in, to some end that we don't know what it looks like. Um, and I think that you know one thing that can move this along is, is more public space and more outdoor space. Um, because a lot of times I see us at actions or I see us in conversations like this and I don't see new faces. Um, and that means conversations are, are, are too inward. And so I'd like to see public space again so that these conversations can be more outward and more inviting. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, I think it's public space is also really important because a lot of people who um, have never been doing this type of work before found their basic needs uh, met in a space that allowed them to do that. I think that's really important. People feeling like they have stability uh, and resources so that they can commit their life to that um, really grew the movement, at least for a period of time. And without that, we're kind of stagnant. So, um, and, I, and in terms of vision, I also think um, Yo Tom said something about demanding an alternative. And I think it's okay to demand an alternative, but I think it's also good to admit that we don't know what that's going to look like. Um, and we shouldn't impose any kind of vision based on these older forms or older theoretical conversations, we should have a new one. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk much longer. I think there's enough people. Uh, thank you, Sandy and Yotam and Melanie, for the presentations. And we'll, we'll open it up real, real quick. Right um, I am going to take a uh, speaker's list. And one second, please. And um, I'll just repeat the questions that are being considered uh, up here. And that is, uh, what has been the actual process for developing a longer-term vision for the Occupy Wall Street movement? What might need to happen for this process to move forward in a way that strengthens the movement? What general elements might or ought to be part of this long-term vision? And um, feel free to, to comment yourself on these questions or, or comment or ask questions. And I, I will try to um, uh, give as many people an opportunity to participate within the, the time limits we have. We have about an hour exactly before we need to get out. So um, I'll just take a, a start taking a speaker's list. And I'll, I'll take three at a time, um, and then we'll, we'll do that. And then if I could ask you to keep your, your comments or questions down to about three minutes, um, that would be excellent. Uh, anybody? Yes. One second, one second, one second. No, no, the reason why I'm pushing, and I'd like to ask you a question. Wait, but this is... No, no, it's relevant. It's it seldom do it. Okay, well, we... It's seldom do it. There is a reason. And once you hear the reason, you'll know the time. How many people here have been at meeting of the vision and goal working group? Other than me? Me? None of them. I have. You? Sorry. How many of you have been... Hang on. Yeah, let's let's. There's a there's a no, process, there please. Because they've been bullshitting without knowing what they are talking about with the possible effect of Sandy who gave a one-sided position. Therefore, I'm asking you to tell it straight. We are being told that we have three experts in the in the horizontal universe. You can you bullshit. You are not the expert. It's no, no. You are going to listen and there is a reason why I'm doing I, this. Hang on. Enough GA Excuse to me. I'm doing this. Uh, we don't agree with you. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's take a speaker's list. Let's take a speaker's list. Okay. Hang on. You, excuse me, sir. We have one person. One, one person who's on the speaker's list and then a second. Is there a third? I wouldn't be the third. Sorry. You, you, you there. So, you there? Okay, go ahead. Um, my question is, please, oh, oh, thank you. Um, my question is, how can Occupy politicize, radicalize, and mobilize low-income people living out in Bronx, living in Harlem, living in Queens, living in the southern states like Louisiana? How can Occupy politicize, radicalize, and mobilize these people? Because these people, 
These are my people, and we are the 99%. Okay, um, you had a, a commentary question. Well, is this question or comments? It's you you questions or comments. We're taking three at a time. And, and well, okay. oh, yeah. So I, I'm from Grass Valley, California, a small town about an hour and a half east of Sacramento. And I want to thank the folks in New York because I came out of retirement as an activist because of what Occupy did, like probably so many people in the you country. Have to take care of them. And there you go. I think you might have to start taking care of the mic at some point because I, I'm, I'm moderating. I can't go around and get the mic. I, I'm done. So oh, anyway, I just think this movement is so inspiring, and despite a lot of the contention happening around issues of nonviolence, diversity of tactics, or whatever, we're going to work, work, the, the country's going to work through that, things are going to morph, the movement's going to grow. I mean, I really, really believe that. Um, um, I, I, I think that, I don't know if this is vision, maybe this is strategy or tactics, but one of the most inspiring things for me before Occupy was Seattle, 1999. And, um, you know, the movement's taken a lot of um, inspiration from what's going on in uh, the Middle East, right, in the Arab world, and in Greece, and in Israel, you know. But um, there's a crucial difference. Like, we're, we are probably not going to get 500,000 people to come out in general strikes anytime soon in any major city in this country. Um, so we may need to organize slightly differently than they can do in these other countries. But that's okay. We don't have to despair about that because, you know, a smaller amount of people can wreak as much havoc and, and capture the imagination of this country more like we did in Seattle. And, and that's through um, uh, direct action and nonviolent civil disobedience. With a medium amount of people, you, we shut down the um, uh, WTO conference. It was great. So um, uh, if, if New York has a special responsibility in the country or world right now because of what they did to inspire all the rest of us, including my tiny town, you may have another responsibility to rejuvenate this movement at this time. And I'm, I went to the GA uh, a couple nights ago. I, I don't know if you're going to get consensus for any kind of... Mm -hmm. it, it's really degenerated. But I think that's okay. Another group can form with a dozen people doing an appropriate CD action at an appropriate target with the media out there. This spring could just take off around the country. So I want to encourage you all here to uh, think about that and, and maybe do that. Um, lastly, our little town produces these like propaganda for the movement. Maybe you've seen some of them, Occu cards. Anyone can speak to me if you like them. They're educational info cards for the Occupy movement. So see me after. Thank you. And thank you, New York. You had a, a comment there? Thank you. My name is Travis Morales, and I work with the Revolutionary Communist Party. And down at Occupy, I was part of the Stop, Stop, and Frisk working group that took Stop and Frisk to the GA where it's passed. And we went up into the first civil disobedience up in Harlem against the policy of Stop and Frisk. And was also one of the organizers and co-moderators of the February 28th rally at Union Square, the Stop, the Suppression of Occupy, and Stand with Occupy, where a whole range of voices of conscience came to speak. And that's sort of the background of the point I wanted to make is that uh, Yotam was making this very important point about the need to dream big in terms of a vision of a, how the world could be different in my view, how the world could be different and what it would take to get there. But we're up against something right now in Occupy around this. I mean, one of the things that really got unleashed in Occupy was for the first time in decades, the ice overthinking of people in this country began to thaw out a bit. And people were dreaming about how the world could be different. Why is there such obscene poverty in the hands of such a small handful when there's such uh, poverty in the world? And why is the world this way? Why are they destroying the planet? And does it have to be this way? And for those of us who are revolutionaries, it's very exciting to have revolution in the air again, people talking about that. Well, and getting back to what Yotam was saying, but we're up, we're up against something here. The fact is we have been suppressed. Whenever we try and do something good right now, we're, we're facing mass arrests, we're facing brutality, there, we've been the victims and the targets of coordinated, systematic, nationwide spying, homeland security, and brutality and violence against expression and thought. And we're in a situation where, quite frankly, if you go outside this movement 
and outside the movements of the left, most people think this movement has gone away. That's what they're being told in the press. And beyond that, people within Occupy were having meetings, planning different activities, and we're having, people are having to limit what they do politically and take into account what the police are going to do. Other people outside Occupy are, are being intimidated and scared to become part of this movement because of this. And what we tried to do start on the 28th, and I think it needs to go forward, I have copies of a call for mass, mass action to the pressure of the Occupy movement here, is to draw forward the two things that we have. They have the violence and the brutality which they brought down on us. We have right on our side and the support of millions of people. And we need, if we're going to go forward with a vision and actually build this movement, we need to figure out how to call out the thousands and thousands of people that need to be in the streets who are not part of this movement, but who've been inspired by it and whose imagination was captured by it to stand with this movement, to say this is intolerable, we're not going to stand for it, and create a political situation where they can't get away with their rubber bullets, their tear gas, their beatings, and their mass arrests. So I want to put that on the agenda for discussion. I really do not know what makes them experts to enter when they have not been involved in the visioning process okay, let's of all WHO okay. and Deborah Mann. Can I see a show of, of support for uh, a speaker's list in this, this process, if there is one? Let me, let me, I guess, pose the question. Should I have a speaker's list where people can either comment or question yes. and, and ask questions of this? So if, are people in agreement with that? Or? Yes, definitely. It's a question. Oh, okay. So, uh, discussion? So we're going to continue with the, the speakers list, if that's okay with everybody. It's okay with you. <laughs> I, I saw most of, most of the support. Okay, so there was a, there was a question a, about reaching out to other communities in the 99%, and that was directed for <laughs> you, either any of you three. Um, yeah, I, well, actually, I don't, I don't really know. I, don't, I mean, I don't know, because uh, I, I come from an international perspective, so it's really difficult for me to talk about how you would even begin to address um, kind of getting people active in, in low-income communities. I think any efforts um, have to come from a, a real appreciation of their struggle. And, uh, and at a baseline, and I think um, it's it's weird for me to think about myself as an occupier going into a community that I have no experience with and no knowledge of how it operates and how it runs, and and asking people to participate in something. It's it's just to me a weird disconnect. I think it needs to come from people in that community, and they should be the ones to make that ask and make that connection, because I feel like. Um, People that have have that I knew before this movement that were personal friends that maybe are now participating are only participating because of a personal relationship and like a very deep conversations and it's not it didn't come from canvassing or door knocking which is also to me in my personal opinion a some of a real impersonal approach um, so I, I that's all I I think it just needs to to really come from like a real understanding of, of who they are and where they're coming from. I'm happy to add to that, but I feel like you're the, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, I, I, I mean, I, um, I think it's, I, I think there's like, mul like multiple ways. I don't think that there's one way or another. Um, as far as I think, as far, I mean, listen. There's a lot of people in, in, in low wage workplaces that are, are dealing with so many, many things, right? I mean, not only are they just getting paid low wages, it's also probably where they live, where they, you know, my, I mean, like, I live in Bedside, it's a police state. I got a tower tearing down the block, you know? Um, so I, I like, you know, I know, I know what it's like. I'm not necessarily low wage anymore, but yeah, not also high <laughs> wages. Um, but I mean, what, you know, what we started to do, I mean, I can only talk from experience about, like, like, where I work, we started just having meetings and just, like, assemblies 
like our own assemblies and just started having it at, you know, every Tuesday night. My workplace has an assembly. We all talk to each other. We, you know, connect. Um, and I think that, but there are things to support that would be, like, I mean, the only way I can think of it is in a New York context, for instance, where minimum wage is, like, an issue right now, right? There's the state's trying to raise, raise the minimum wage. And... Right, rent stabilization, REBNY, you know, I, I worked on the Erdstat law, like repeal the Erdstat laws, which is the laws that the state senate controls our rent laws and not the city council. Um, I worked on that campaign. Um, and it's like, hopefully supporting that, I mean, not everybody does, like there's a multitude of ways. For me, like, I'm going to support, me personally, I'm going to go out and support the minimum wage. If there's a rally, I'm going to go to it and I'm going to show support. But other people don't necessarily have to. But I think that's really showing support for those issues that are being worked on. That helps, actually, that is going to actually impact them, so they can have this space, and folks can have the space to feel a part of it and to feel that they can, they can do something as well. I think it's a. I mean, I think it's an, an important question because it gets at the heart of what we're trying to do here. Is how do we become a mass movement? So it's not. I mean, I think I would like to kind of. Uh, you know, expand the question into that. In reality, I mean, what we've what we've done right, we've done a lot already. Um, we've kind of opened doors to a lot of possibilities. I think that's what a lot of the sort of questions and comments reveal, and I think that's what a lot of uh, it's like. It's why a lot of us are here today. I think. I mean, left forum today feels different than it did a year ago, and and part of that has to do with the possibilities that that have been opened by this kind of explosive moment, this kind of like shattering through uh, into into you know a potential potential possibilities that are here. Uh, but we haven't become a mass movement yet. We've had, we've had mass moments, and some of the actions that we've had have had mass character. Uh, but we're not a mass movement in the sense that we're like a, that we're broad, that we're a broad movement with infrastructure led by the most oppressed and marginalized people, able to struggle, you know, over an incredibly long-term period of time to have a really meaningful social transformation. We're not that yet. Uh, and that's okay, because <laughs> we're like, Six months old, and I mean, I also think it's important to to like count to to count back further than that. So maybe this is six month old, but it also rests on the back of you know uh, budget campaigns of before that and uprisings all over the Middle East, and like twenty years of hard organizing done in in like low income communities all over New York City and all over the country. So I, I think it's really important to also um, give credit to that, and that this is you know that there were important foundations to what we're doing. But we're at the point now where we're only at the very, very beginning of what might become a popular movement. Um, and so I think the question, like, the, the question is, how do we become a, a mass movement? And, like, fuck if I knew the answer to that. I mean, shit. <laughs> like, I, and, and unfortunately, there isn't one answer. There are a lot of different answers. I mean, I think one of the answers is having vision. I think that that's like a, a way of opening conversations with people. I think that that's how you build consensus. You have ideas that people then like come around and debate and push back on. And so that's one thing. But that's but that's only one. Another uh, is is building actual infrastructure for a movement that then allows people to struggle. Um, that meets people's needs while they struggle. The occupation is a really good microcosm of that. Like Sandy said, it allowed people to literally come from like all over the country and just decide that their entire lives was going to be this struggle. I mean, that's a really that's a small version of what of, of what we mean when we say infrastructure that belongs to a movement. Like movement institutions were at the very beginning of what might be movement times that then develop movement institutions where people actually spend their lives in the movement, growing the movement. So that's another thing. Another thing is winning things. That's no joke. I mean, winning things are, is really, really important. And, uh, and sometimes it means uh, like settling-ish, like accepting a victory while continuing to build the movement, like accepting victories in order to build your critical mass that can then continue to struggle for more victories, ultimately understanding that in the end, like not in the end, there is no end, and it's also multiple uprisings, but, it's, but that at points there need to be serious confrontations that actually break with systems. Uh, but that being said, we have to win along the way. We've got to win along the way to prove that, it's pet, that we can win and that this is a worthy project, but also because winning along the way means meeting people's needs to be able to struggle more. So the question is not what, the question is not do we need wins, it's what kinds of wins do we want and how do we want to organize for them. So, you know, a really good example of a win that we might fight for is uh, a free CUNY, you know, in New York, or, or just, uh, you know, free education in general. That's an incredibly important win because it allows people to be educated, but it also means that you don't, you know, right now, why don't we have a student movement? Because students are working two jobs and paying for school. I mean, if we, you know, to win a free CUNY means that you can, that you now are freed up to, you have met some of your needs and now can become a revolutionary. I and mean, that's an incredibly important 
process. And we've got to win things in order to be able to build our own power to be able to take more wins. Um, and so I think that that's part of the way, but that's, you know, part of the answer to some of these. And then a lot of it has to do also with internal dynamics and making sure that we're, that, that you know, uh, that as we grow as a movement, we're meeting the needs of the people who are actually in it, that people feel good being in the movement. Not only, you know, that we're, at, that we're countering all the oppression that we've internalized, but also that this is like the coolest thing that anyone's ever done. I mean, this is the sexiest thing. That you have to, you know, it's like you want to have a good life. You got to be in the movement, and 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 also that the movement will be a good life. Like we don't want a movement of martyrs. That's not a good idea because we're not going to last very long that way. That's not an attractive movement to be in. It's like you want to. We, we actually want to live. We actually want to enjoy. Like the revolution is not only for our grandkids. It's also for us. So if you're not smart enough, you don't get into the charter school. But the poor school is good for special education kids, and it's a whole problem. And I feel like unless and I think there, everybody can have kind of different visions and movements of how this goes, but unless we figure out that bridge, it will always be a challenge to be you know, able to connect um, low-income communities of color and the Occupy movement. Because they understand it, but they don't necessarily know how to engage. And I sometimes find that I'm like, am I Occupy? I mean, I, I love, I'm a, I'm a movement person. I've been a progressive since I was, you know, forever since I was born. But, do, but, you know, like, in my mind, right, that's how I feel, but am, am I Occupy, right? Like, do I, do you guys understand where I come from? Is, it, you know, like, so it's a connection and it's an issue that I think that we all have to kind of figure out. And I think once you figure that out, and it's a loaded question, then I think there is an opportunity to bring it. I also think bridging with community organizations and forcing them, right, because sometimes you just have to kind of smack them around and say, no, 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 we need to. This is larger than you. This is larger than your organization, right? Like, you need to allow us in, whether you like it or not, and force that kind of conversation would also allow. I mean, I had those, Lily and I was fighting with communities and so on, but it's like creating that inviting openness and allowing people to have those type of decision making. And it's also them lowering their portion of arrogance and our portion of arrogance of thinking of knowing what we want will allow a better, you know, equitable opportunity for people. So that's it. Question, what is Occupy Wall Street right now? Is it an organization? Is it a set of beliefs? Is it a brand? Um, also, where is it going? Is it going to be not occupying elections? I like her question, said the woman from the Bronx. What are the role of community organizations to Occupy Wall Street? Can they use the rubric or the brand or the attitude of Occupy Wall Street? Is that kosher? If you could uh, address those questions, I'd when I see uh, like the question here on like what is Occupy Wall Street? Is it a brand? Is it a, uh, for me? It almost I, I I'd like to ask you guys uh, to what level do you think creating institutions that are participatory and bring people in and embrace them and are able able to view them their struggle in solidarity with other struggles and to show up for them? How much do you think that plays into us determining a vision? Um, okay, so, like, two things that I, I, I think are interesting. Um, one is about uh, race um, and bridging this, 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 you know, building a bridge to communities of color. Um, it's, to me, it's very interesting because there's, like, two dynamics, and I feel like in a couple of different spaces, like, I've kind of repeated myself in this conversation where it's, like, um, there, I just remember this one instance when we were like organizing with the Goldman Sachs trial, and this woman from a teacher from DC 37 looked at one of my friends, actually Zach, and was and said, you know, um, she she said, oh, it's now all the white kids are in the park getting beat up, so you know we've been going through that for years, and like kind of just kind of this condescending viewpoint of like y'all just got hip to the game, and I really. It kind of it pissed me off because it's like there's so much assumption both ways, you know, like you look at the park or you look at people who are in this room and you think, oh, this is kind of a homogenous group. Everyone here is like white middle class, younger, um, but there's a lot of assumptions in that. And so it's, I, I don't know how to, to keep that dialogue flowing so that um, when people want to go to, uh, you know, like what is seen as a community of color, there's like a... There is an inviting thing. I, I think it has to be both ways. It, it can't be Occupy saying, this is the way to go, this is what we're doing now, but it can't be these communities saying, y'all don't really know what the fuck's going on. It has, it, it has to be like this, 
this nice feeling and I don't know how to, to create that other than like being invited in and like you know, being very clear about that. Um, and then one thing that I think is a really strong thread that I've seen in other occupation cities is actually a huge divide between community-based organizations and Occupy. Um, that was like very strong um, in, in Philly, um, in Boston, in a lot of places where it was like um, people were the new hottest thing on the block and it kind of went to their head and they forgot about all the hard work. Um, and so, you know, doing a lot of damage control on that I think is really important. Um, but I think different organizations have to to be willing to open up a little bit and say, you're right, I've been going a certain way and it's not worked. So here's some, here's some new energy. Let's see how we can like come together around it. Um, that's just a couple of thoughts I have. Um, my voice is getting increasingly worse. Uh, <laughs> It is, it, yeah, with, with community-based organizations, because I, I used, to, used to work for it and work for it. Um, I think that there, there, there is a lot in it. Like, we just have to always keep an open dialogue at this point, I think. And I think I see that happening with a lot of the organizing, at least in New York, that's going towards May Day, um, where it is totally different groups of people, free to do what they want, but trying to be collective, and come together at, at a certain place in time where other events or other days of action, I don't know if that was what it was. It seemed one-sided or not. I actually think it's been pretty participatory with um, Mayday. Sorry, I sound like this. Um, and smart. And I, and I kind of like what uh, Gary was saying with participatory, you know, I think that I hope that that's what some of the visions are. Like, I do agree that it's, we're going to have multiple different visions as, as we have multiple tactics, and I think that hopefully some visions, that, I mean, m me personally, my vision is participatory, you know, participatory places where people feel liberated, but some people it's kind of like not. Some people, some participation doesn't work for them or whatever, um, which is fine. Um, as far as, you know, and, and, and race too, I think one of the things that I've, I've I pers in my personal experience with race and life and just living in, I've, I've, I've lived in mostly, this is the first time I've lived in a majority community of color. Mostly I've lived in other communities, majority, specifically Irish communities that I've lived in. And I, we at Occupy did something where, and, and it actually goes to, to what you were judging earlier about experts and so on and so forth and people whose faces have been seen and heard, which is why, you know, we're up here. Um, but also, I know that for a while, for the first couple of weeks, myself, Sandy, some other folks, were thrown in front of a camera um, because we were of color and thrown into facilitation because we were of color. Not that I didn't want I liked facilitating. I mean, it was crazy, but like, <laughs> I mean, 10 hour fucking general assembly sometimes. But we did, I mean, that happened. Not, like, we have to acknowledge that. And I think that <coughs> we, have, we still have a lot to learn about race and gender and keeping that dialogue open. I really just think it's about a participatory dialogue around those issues because I still don't think that we fully I don't grasp the con concepts of it and uh, you know and that you know my you know I, I don't gra even grasp the concepts and struggles of, of, of a lot of queer communities and you know I grew up with queer parents you know like I don't you know, I, I still don't under it fully stand because there's so many different ways that oppression sneaks in and there's so many different ways because the, the systems that oppress us have done that on purpose. It's like they were the octopus that spread and now we're trying to be the, the, the new octopus. So I think that it's just like a dialogue that we have to always maintain and always be honest with it. and it's hard, right? Because like there's sometimes brutal truth that we don't want to hear or we don't want like it hurts our feelings or so on and so forth, but we have to be we have to be open and honest with each other. And like, I think we can do that in retrospect, but it would have been nice to do that then, you know, instead of being like, oh, like, Malini, like, you should go and facilitate because you're good at that. And like, it's like, okay, so can, it's like, it's, it, you know, it's like, okay, but well, let's be honest, you know, like, if it was, uh, if it was honesty at that point, we probably could have worked out the kinks a little bit better. So I think that that's, the, with race and, and, and issues like that, we have to figure out 
who are the people, folks in the community, it, it, communities of color that are already there because their people are there in a part of the movement, and we do, as Sammy's saying, like generalize and, 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 and stereotype and say, like, oh, like, well, this is just this group of people, and we're doing the same thing again that society has done to us. So it's like, how do we actually start changing the way we think about, about that whole conversation? Um. Yeah, a real, a real quick. I mean, I think that those, that those were really good and important answers, and also that we're not, we're not experts at this, and we haven't figured out. I mean, in reality, if you look at, the, at where the movement is right now, that's something that we're in the process of trying to answer collectively, and, and we're at where we're at. Um, I, part of the way that I would answer your question about kind of what it, what is this thing. Is I don't know, <laughs> um, but uh, but that I think the most important question is what's the movement broader than Occupy, and I'm not sure if Occupy is the big tent or maybe it's like one kind of um, tendency within it, or maybe it's a narrative that like flows through. I'm not really exactly sure, but I'm not, I'm not so concerned with it. I think the question is what's the movement and how do we build a movement? And, and I don't mean to that, uh, that was not. I hope that didn't come off as like. Flipping, I just I I don't know, and I but I think that that's uh, that either way that that's a small part of the question that's much broader, which is how do we build uh, a large movement that it, that allows different groups and individuals the autonomy <coughs> they need in order to carry out their own struggles and live their own lives while being in solidarity with something bigger, um, and and I think that again you know I, I think we said that uh, you know that that this was mentioned a little bit earlier too, but that that's like I think one of the centerpieces of the kind of movement we should be building, not coincidentally, because that's also part of the centerpiece of the world that we want. We also want a world where people have the autonomy to manage their own lives and communities that get to design their own destinies while being in solidarity with something much broader. Um, and so the movement needs to look like that. And I think that that's part of the, you know, the, the leap that we have to make in our minds in order to open this to become a movement that actually um, can fit all of the different needs of the different groups of people who exist in the world. Um, and I think, uh, I think we also have to have um, a more sophisticated analysis. Yeah, it, it, I would put this as very secondary to the kind of stuff that Nalini and Sandy were talking about, about kind of like really creating space for dialogue and working with each other. But I think um, having, having a, um, an analysis of how oppression functions is incredibly important. And, and being able to actually think and talk about patriarchy and white supremacy and authoritarianism and not just capitalism. Capitalism's become uh, like one of the things that, and that's also, by the way, awesome, that capitalism is a thing that's on the table now in a way that it might not have been a few months ago. That's a huge advancement, but if we stop there, then that's a, that's a bit of a cop-out. There's nothing about capitalism that says that women have to be paid lower than men. That's not, a, that's not a feature of capitalism. That's a feature of patriarchy that has helped define this form of capitalism that we experience. There's nothing about capitalism that says the peop that men of color need to be targeted for violence and women of color need to be targeted for, for sexual violence. There's nothing about capitalism that has that rule. That's a rule, that's a rule that white supremacy and patriarchy have, have uh, asserted and, and helped define capitalism <laughs> with. Um, and so we need to have an analysis of how all those different systems of oppression work and, and how they um, kind of uh, work together to sort of like form this totality of oppression that we're experiencing. And when we have that, and, and I don't mean that just because like we're at left form and it's cool to talk about theory, although that's like fun maybe, but I think the, 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 the theory is important because it, it's what helps us figure out what we need to be fighting and how. So it's like if we think white supremacy is a real thing and that it's not just an afterthought of capitalism, then we had better start organizing around white supremacy. And there are people who are doing that. You know, fighting against the prison industrial complex is one of the ways that the movement is starting to adjust to this concept of uh, needing to confront white supremacy. And that is also part of the way that we build a movement that can, that because we fight, we engage in a variety of different struggles that opens the door for a variety of different groups with different interests. And fighting in different ways is another way to open the door to different people. Um, so that is so nice. Uh, we'll take three more uh, folks. You have a question? I'm going to take, I'm going to take folks who haven't spoken yet. Um, I want 
I want to hear your advice. Um, yeah, I, I guess like kind of working on that and idea of take measuring. Um, actually, I was just at Take Back the Land uh, panel, and those um, someone from Take Back the Land said like something about to tokenizing the idea of merging like over bridging over like racial differences. And a really, uh, I think, great example of like they define tokenizing as like if this is about something that you are not willing to admit is about race, do not go find someone and use them as, like, look how diverse we are. Unless you're going to be flat out honest. Like, I have also been called for facilitation. And they, I've had someone, I was much more flattered when someone said to me, look, we are an all-white facilitation team right now, and I would very much so, like, appreciate if you could just offer, like, your very strong voice in being part of that. And I think that's really important. Um, but, like, going on that and, like, I got a lot of internalized shit, for lack of a word, uh, going on. Um, so, like, you know, I am a woman. I identify as queer, and, like, I am of color. And I think what, you know, we are talking about uh, trickling, oppression's trickling in, and I think internalized is, like, internalized oppression is an il infiltrator. And that so directly affects our ability to dream big. And I think that... Um, you know, what I have experienced my own personal, like, wins and in involvement in Occupy and organizing, and I guess, like, to kind of get your perspectives, like, you personally, like, what for you was a winning moment in your involvement in Occupy, and, like, how has that influenced or inspired your vision? I know Yopal mentioned something earlier about Occupy even happening, but I guess I kind of want to get down to, like, being able to identify those vision-inspiring moments in, like, how it is possible and like I guess that's going the strategy but kind of going back to the idea of like vision being kind of that anchor that um, like heightens commitment so my question was uh, for the speakers about what they think the role of physical encampments are moving forward especially moving the spring and summer um, quick background I'm an organizer with Occupy Albany for two months, we had a really vibrant encampment um, in Academy Park right across from the New York State Capitol. Um, we were kind of violently evicted at the end of December. Uh, we've since opened up a, a storefront in Albany where we kind of run our organizing out of. Uh, but we've got a reoccupation working group that's coming up with recommendations for the General Assembly. And there's really active debates right now as to whether or not physical encampments are kind of central. Uh, and important to what Occupy is, or if it was really just kind of a short-term tactic, and we should, it, it saps kind of energy and resources and takes up too much time with the logistics of running camp, and we should be looking in other directions, but a lot of people also um, are very committed to kind of moving back in in the near future and trying to retake our park and establish a physical encampment. So I'm wondering what you see kind of medium-term vision in terms of the role of physical encampment. Um, awesome Occupy Homes, New York, woohoo, so <laughs> that's cool. Um, uh, as, as as far as the, I kind of had the same feeling as, as Amanda had said before, where when I knew where it was, when it was not said, it was just kind of like, oh, go, you know, go facility, like you should, and then we were talking about step up, step back, but it was like, no, you should, you, you should keep on stepping up, and I was like, but what if, I, I literally one day said, what if I want to step back, and somebody said, well, young women, women of color should never step back, and I was like, mm, well, you know, it was a little problematic for, for me, because I was like, no, I, I want to step back, I, I, like, I know what I want to step back, so, um, <laughs> So that you know, it, it it was it was problematic, and but I and I did I actually did with started I haven't really been a part of the facilitation working group since then because I had that was my kind of trauma, um, but I think that I saw I never there was no doubt in my mind that I ever want to part with the encampment or like the actual like the movement. There was no doubt because I knew that we were learning. I mean, like that's the whole thing, right? Like, yeah, yeah. It, like, I don't know, I didn't really know what civil disobedience was. He's like, oh, I knew sit-down strikes and sit-ins and stuff like that from reading it, but I didn't know what it looked like. I wasn't a part of I was too, uh, you know, too, too young to be a part of, a, like, the, the 
<clears throat> the band's like globalization I was you know I wasn't really a part of I did stuff in high school but still it was like my high school was like oh we're art students like it's yeah. art like you know they didn't really take us seriously yeah. so I, I, I think that I, I never wanted a part because I knew that we were still learning um, but again I, I think if there's a problem like I, I, I did then start saying like listen I feel uncomfortable with being if, if I was in a room with all all either especially specifically like white males and I'm you know I, I'll say it and you should always, like, you know, hey, isn't this problematic here? Um, and again, discussion, right? I think it's really about the discussion. And then it's, it's, it's all about how you feel. If you feel so uncomfortable and it's so against your, I mean, you have to do what, what you feel is right. Um, as, as, so, so, yeah, I just, I just feel that, like, we need to address tokenization. We need to, we need to have collective the talks about that um, but it's also really it's really important that you are in touch with how like that's how I figured out what that was for me it was that I started getting to like what where is this coming from with me um and it came like and it went back to like um as far as a winning moment um I I, I, I do work with a lot of labor unions yada, 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 and um the, the first couple of weeks like they didn't know that I was in the park and um, sleeping in the park and I would come to work and like my stuff would be in a corner and they'd be like why what are you doing um and they were all on on Facebook everybody was like oh the stupid movement like they don't know what they're doing and I'm like they're like oh it's all a bunch of white people white people saying this and I'm like oh you know what and so I would like have Facebook fights with people who were right next to me like in a cubicle um and my winning moment for me being a labor person and, and being was was October 5th when we had this the beginning march to see them come down because I felt well, no, I'm not going to cry. Okay. <laughs> I felt, I mean, it was really important because I did, you know, I really want to see those institutions transformed. I mean, they're they're so important to working class people and people who, who have struggled and have such a great history in New York. And and because of all the laws that got against them and because, you know, there are some bureaucrats out there, sorry for people in the room, um, and the hierarchical structures from the horizontal, um, I didn't know if they had it in them anymore, so it was really amazing to see them come down that day and like really just and like fill the park. I mean, there was no space, so that was really awesome. And as far as encampments, I think that we need. I, I think we need to take over buildings. I think we need community centers. I think we need cultural centers because like outside encampments in the Northeast are a little hard throughout the winter time. Even though it can be done, but but I definitely think space is a huge issue, and there's so much empty space and in cities that where there's really empty spaces that I'm talking I know people are in Detroit in this room take over buildings please um, take over those spaces because it. I think it's really I think it's, it's critical like we don't have organizing spaces spaces a resource and a resource that we can reclaim yeah I mean I, I agree about occupation I think that we need to transition into a form of occupation that's for keeps that we're taking back the things that we want to keep and using that as the space in which we, we build alternatives and, and stage a fight outwards. But I also do think it's important to have like broad public space that allows people to, to like uh, be drawn to a magnet and like and, and, and kind of like have their first touch into a movement. So I, I mean I, I think it is important that the question of whether it saps our energy or that that I think that has to do with the real like cost benefit analysis on, like in, in reality on the ground. I think I think it's a pretty case by case thing. Uh, but I think occupation is really important because it is claiming space in order to develop the world that we want while also having the space to fight back out of. So I mean, I, I, and you know, and a space for like building a coherent group, like for building a building a community which becomes a movement. Um, so I think I think it is important. Um, trying to remember what the other... Uh, okay, so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to say one quick thing about the, uh, uh, about the, the race thing again, but from, from my angle, which I actually think might be really relevant to this room and, and to this conference and to this movement, is we have to figure out how to be allies. Uh, that we have an enormous amount of responsibility to be a part of undoing the oppression that we are part of perpetuating and that's a really tricky thing so I don't have a I don't have a very clear like 10-step process but it, it obviously has to do with not only like checking our own privilege but also helping create uh, structures and institutions that hold us accountable um, and I, I know I've like learned a fucking ton from being here um, and I'm only at the very beginning of that like process of, of like 
you know, I don't know, uh, like redeveloping my my participation in the movement. Um, and I think so. That's that's something that we have a lot to learn about. And so I, I wanted to just I wanted to speak to that because I don't think it's only a question for the women of color in the room. It's like this is a question for all of us, uh, and it's and we have a lot of a tremendous responsibility. Um, and then the the last thing about um, like winning moments is uh, the I had. Um, I wrote about this a little bit too because it actually like really changed my life. Actually, was just a, one evening of sitting with friends that I had met in the movement, most of whom I didn't know, um, and just having a conversation that where we where we kind of went around and said, you know, what we were working on in the movement and where it was this was like early October, late September, and I had this like aha moment kind of um, that was just. It was it was kind of surreal, honestly. When I think back about it, it was really surreal. And that moment, it was like blew my mind. But it was like, oh, we're winning. Like, so what do we want? And it was, you know, again, like I want to check that because it's not like we're winning in the sense that we've like captured all these institutions and we're like running the show and we've got a big vibrant movement. We're at the very beginning of this thing. But even just the idea that it's possible to win and that we were winning something that we that like the 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 powers that be were at, were chasing after us to try to recl to, to try to rein us in or reclaim the narrative or stamp us out or or whatever that we were kind of on top for a second and not and you know still things are being like ripped away from us like public schools and and so on and we and and so I, so I want to temper that idea of winning but that that moment of thinking like oh we actually like people are the world is watching. Like that slogan became a real thing. Like, holy shit, we have this is like what in the hell is going on? Like what's going on in that park? Like what is the you know, and this kind of exploding your brain thing where it's like, Oh, this is a real this is real. This is like holy shit, what a responsibility we've got and what potential and how like how many doors that's open. It's like change the trajectory of so many lives. That's one of the things, by the way, that I that I always say when people ask, like, is this thing gonna go away? And my response about that is like, I don't know what's gonna happen to Occupy like as a brand. I don't I have no idea about that, but I but this thing, this like whatever is kind of bubbling right now, is not gonna go anywhere because the conditions that brought us here are gonna continue and they're only gonna worsen. And the and this moment, the political moment we've been a part of has already truly transform the trajectories of so many people's lives. Like, I know where I was before this thing. It was, like, grumpy and upset and thinking the left is dead and, like, being depressed about it and, like, broke and, like, lying around my parents' house, like, the fuck am I, you know? <laughs> I'm still broke, but, the, but, but, the, but, but with a renewed sense of purpose and possibility. Um, so. um. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be quick. I mean, to me, the like most inspiring moment uh, is very much tied to the encampment question. Like, um, w like waking up and realizing um, that I really care about every single person that like was in that camp and that remains um, was like to me the most inspiring moment when I. Even like when I think about um, yesterday in the park, I saw Captain America, and many of you know who Captain America is if you were in the park. And when someone says like we don't need an encampment, it, that actually really hurts my feelings because I think I feel like I wouldn't know Captain America, and I don't even interact with him on a day-to-day -day basis. But I give a damn about where he is and what he's like. When I see him, I'm like, yeah, he's here. Um, and so like to me, the the camp really was. Um, allowing me to make relationships with people I never would have made relationships with because I had some fucked idea about who I could relate to in the past. And so um, it's just like realizing that I actually really, 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 truly, deeply care about a lot of people that I never would have. Um, and like owning that and like acknowledging that that was screwed up. Um, and then with the question about being tokenized, I, I actually there's a few people in this room that like I know have been tokenized. And it sucks, um, but it's also like some days picking your battle. I don't. I don't even know. Like to me, it's like an assumption. Like Nalini and I, like mentioned, we grew up in. Um, I grew up. My mom's white, and I grew up with her out of this country. And sometimes people look at me and think I've had an experience here with race that I haven't had, and it makes me laugh because it's just like that's really stupid. Um, I'm actually like really privileged, and I was really fortunate. Um, and I don't feel 
marginalized i feel like i'm a very assertive person and personality and so like it's just weird like these assumptions that are thrown at people and um so like some days you can choose to actually throw that back in someone's face and some days you just like yeah whatever i'll facilitate um <laughs> whatever it's just like it's i don't know it's like yeah you can it's it's like you can make it a point every day or you you, you don't but it just depends on where you're at so it's just, um, I think it's just more important to, to just remember, like, we can't assume anything about anyone we meet. It's just, like, like not at all. It's the worst thing you can do, so. We have just <clears throat> under 10 minutes, so if we can take um, three final folks who haven't spoken yet. I see three, three hands. Sorry, we're just going to take folks who haven't responded yet. You, you, and you. Maybe we could go in that back, back with uh, starting from you and then you and then you. <coughs> in a lot of different ways. Um, I, I wanted to speak to, I have a comment about, people have been talking about kind of the different, very deep divisions that exist under the system. And I think that Occupy has shown the basis, you know, between these different sections of people, the sections of oppressed people, the immigrants, the sections of oppressed nationalities, and then the, the middle strata, and, and um, enlightened and progressive people, the basis of unity. But I don't think these deep divisions can be overcome without a revolution, without the radical transformation of, of society. And I think there's a need um, within Occupy for a section of people, for people to begin to get into that question and to be won over to the need to develop the struggle further for revolution. And the question of what kind of organization is it gonna take in order to make such a revolution because I don't, I don't think the horizontalism is not actually going to do it. What kind of organization, what kind of outlook and method, and yes, what kind of leadership is it going to take to overcome all of this? And um, everyone here should get a copy from me or Travis of the reflection from Bob Avakian, the leader of the Revolutionary Communist Party, on the Occupy movement, an inspiring beginning, and the need to go further. And then I have a question that I want to pose because I do think that people on the panel and also just in Occupy are walking past the question of the suppression that's actually going on. That's not just about the confrontation with the police on the street, which is an expression of it, but there's something bigger that happened. This suppression, like this movement, we were, we were changing things. We were changing the terrain. People were talking about the economic inequalities and, and people were listening. And it was outside of politics as usual. And they saw the need to crush that, those in power. And then there were victories that were real. And I can relate to what Yotam was saying about them. But then now they've attempted to suppress this and to crush it. And how are we going to go forward? How is the Occupy movement going to go forward and get stronger without confronting that suppression? and taking it on and, and through calling out the, the masses of people, through calling forth and organizing and mobilizing the mass action that's needed, and through that getting stronger and coming back and raising all of this again. Uh, there's two other questions we can take from the back. Uh, you, um, right behind yeah. Okay. It doesn't stretch that far, so. Okay. Uh, oh, is this, it's working? Okay. Yeah, th this is, I mean, just a few disparate thoughts, or, or whatever. whatever. Yeah, I, I don't need the microphone. I, I teach, I'm used to speaking fairly loudly. I can do the video. Oh. <laughs> um, is that working? Yeah. Okay, so um, just a, a, a few somewhat disconnected thoughts. I mean, the first is um, I, I teach economics, and we were we were talking about income inequality and lobbyists and how you know uh, it's difficult to make you know to to enact laws that one would con consider you know more more useful. And so students were saying, well, what, what can we do? You know, what can we do? And I felt somewhat frustrated because, you know, what could they do? So I said, well, you know, what do you think you could do? So I got two answers, and, and it was like the craziest thing. One was vote, and the other was a revolution. It's like, um, and, and how do you go from, like, with this to this? You know, and what I felt a real need for, I mean, this, this is just like a week ago, right? And so what I, what I feel a, a real need for is a way to connect up students with 
some way of getting engaged that is more meaningful than voting or a revolution. You know, I mean, something that actually could in involve them. And most of the, I teach at John Jay, so it's part of CUNY. You know, so the one thing everybody has in common there is they don't have very much money. Um, wh whatever color, ethnic group, or whatever they, they have in kind of common, they don't have much money. Um, and there's a lot of issues that they share, but there's um, there's not there's not a sense of where they could connect up to. They don't have an idea of where they could connect to get engaged in any kind of political activity. When Occupy Wall Street was down there as a physical place, I remember saying, well, why don't you go down there? And also, just in general, there was a physical space that people are, people were totally disconnected, um, don't know where to connect up to. And that, that's what the, physical, the physicality of Occupy Wall Street did. Sorry, this is a question and more of an announcement. We have a building filled with amazing organizers and there's super, super awesome energy in the park right now. So if everyone after this goes straight there, I'm going to try and get Michael Moore to move into the park instead. Um, <laughs> like, honestly, there's, I haven't felt the park like this since October. So, every... Okay. Cool. I'm running around here doing more of this. Uh, <laughs> 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 so we'll just uh, have some quick reactions to that and then head out because we are uh, two minutes away from the session. Um, the, on the impression? Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I mean. <laughs> The question was how to go forward from here, um, how to reach out beyond Occupy. I'm sorry, I'm too excited um, <laughs> to go march. I, I mean, I, I'll just talk about oppression, I think, or the repression by the state. I think it's, I, I don't know, it, it, like, it plays into people's head, it plays into how, what we feel we can and cannot organize, and that sucks. Cause, um, but it's also based on locality. When I was in D.C., we took the streets. Somebody threw a, a smoke bomb inside the White House. You know, that was a protester, and like, you know, no one was beat up by the cop. I mean, it was right there, and it didn't. I mean, so there's different cities where you have different levels of freedom in, in terms of like your ability to be in opposition um, to the state or in opposition to X, Y, or Z. Um, whereas in New York, it's very securitized. This is the 9-11 zone. I mean, like, we're going to experience things differently here. So I think different cities have different strengths in terms of how they want to carry out a fight, and they should play up to that strength. Um, but I, I think here, um, you know, in some, in some ways, the, you know, the Brooklyn Bridge arresting of 700 people, that, that was like a big moment for this movement where suddenly there was a lot more people in it. Um, and so those images are useful in some way, I wouldn't, yeah, useful. Um, but yeah, I, I, we're, I would, I, you know, I think we're all kind of wondering why the hell there isn't more outrage about these, you know, this legislation, these, this series of legislation that's being passed um, that's like actually undermining our ability to be in opposition. Um, and I don't know, I think it's education. Um, but I, I think it's something a little bit more than education and I, I, I think, you know, that's definitely something people need to spend energy on um. Yeah, just real quick about that. I mean, I, I think the, um, like the, the, the like suppression of the movement is a really important thing to talk about and think about because it's not coincidental, and it's really important to look, to learn through experience. Uh, and that's like one of the things that you learn when you're an activist and you're on the street and you're protesting, uh, like you're you're uh, like doing a direct action on a bank. And then all of a sudden, like, the cops have something to do with it. And it really, like, illustrates to you the way that different systems of oppression are connected to each other and that the state is connected to capital and that they're not. So, I mean, I think those things are really important. It's also really important to learn that as, we, as, as the movement grows and becomes more of a threat, we'll face more and more uh, repression. And that's what happens to movements, and we have to be prepared for that. Uh, that being said, I don't like the um, implications of organizing around the suppression that we experience. I think that that's insular. I think it, um, I think that 
it, it, it calls like an enormous amount of attention to the relatively light repression that our movement has experienced in comparison with the kind of repression that most like low income communities of color experience every day and that other movements in other places in the world are experiencing every day in the same struggle as us. And I also think that that's kind of what they want. It's, that's the, that's, they want us to battle with them on their, on their turf, in their terminology, on their issues. Uh, and, and that means the cops and police brutality against protesters. And I don't want to speak their language. I want us to, uh, to, like, to go on the offensive on the, in, in the is, uh, you know, uh, around the issues that we care about and be prepared to defend ourselves. Um, and, and so that's a, a slightly different orientation around that, but that's... Um, okay. um, I'm, I'm going to keep it short because I am really excited to march um, and waste my voice even more. But um, yes, I, I think that it's, it is really important to talk about that. I think there was a teaching, and I think there should possibly, hopefully, be more teachings about COINTELPRO and what happened. Um, you know, during the Black Panther and, and, and um, Black Power movement, and um, and also bleeding into you know um, the the uh, anti-war movement in, in, in during Vietnam. I, I think it's really important, and I but I also agree. I don't want to be reactionary too much reactionary. I want us to be on the offensive, not the defensive. And we have to really. I think it's like a strategy question. What is the right strategy to 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 fight about that? I think that that's what we need to, to talk about again in dialogue. The strategy on, on how to bring and highlight suppression, and also like can create actions or create actual like mass mobilization of, against it. Um, and I know that there was that action, I remember that action, and I think there should be more and really build up an escalation period towards and, you know, build it into whether it's, it's May Day or, or, or after or the escalation period to that, I think it needs to be it built into the strategy too, but as an offensive, not a defensive thing. And thanks. Thank you, everybody. For Thank you all.